<laughs> so I was imagining driving in a car and the car continues to accelerate and continues to accelerate. I mean, that's not going to end well, right? I mean, essentially, <laughs> surely at some point the car's just going to explode. Is that a potential future for our universe? Well, I'm not quite sure. There is a thing called the Big Rip, which would be a case where things would accelerate so fast that like this could have not ideal impacts on this nature space time itself. This is not the first thing that I don't understand about this program, but this is, how could this possibly work? How could the expansion of the universe actually be getting faster? I'm kind of with you on this one, actually. It doesn't make a lot of good intuitive sense, but it doesn't make good intuitive sense to physicists either. Here's Joe. It's one of the biggest conundrums today in astronomy and cosmology is like, why is space speeding up? We have this sort of catch-all thing that we introduce to say it's okay, which is called dark energy, which may just be the energy of empty space itself. You physicists, I honestly. <laughs> well, you know, it's Einstein's fault. He put it in at the beginning. When he actually first came up with the theory of general relativity, which said, yeah, space responds to mass and mass responds to deformed space, he had this thing called the cosmological constant, which did say, you know, even in the absence of apparent mass, that space itself has this energy of its own. So he did actually put it in, and then it got taken out for a number of years, roughly until this more recent measurement was made. So now the astronomers have put it back in again, but we're not really sure what it is. It's in the equations, it's, it, again, we say, yeah, it's the energy of empty space, but do we really understand that? Um, you know, no, we don't. Now, I think I heard you being exasperated by impossible made-up physics no, just then. No, not at all. It's just that we just don't totally know the answer yet. And dark energy is totally theoretical at this point to explain the very real observations. Yeah, theoretical or in layperson's terms, completely made up. Okay, so you know what? You don't own the end of the universe. I asked Andrew Ponson for my very own brand of theoretical answer to facing the final curtain. The reality seems to be that things are being pushed apart faster and faster. So what does that mean for the end? If you make the maximally boring assumption, it will be that everything just continues like that. So stuff gets yanked apart faster and faster over time by this mysterious force, but nothing else much happens. We sometimes call it the heat death. It will just sort of slowly grind to a halt. So that's one possibility, but there are many others. So I think everyone could do with a bit of boring these days. What um, is the time scale for the universal heat death? Oh, the time scale is incredibly long. It's hard to put an exact time scale on it because, well, it's just a sort of slow process. I mean, you're talking about probably at least a thousand times the current age of the universe before it really becomes a problem. OK, so no, no need to panic. Now, so we've had the big crunch, uh, the big freeze. Any other big endings to time and space? Oh, there are so many other possibilities. I mean, I think one of my favourites is something called vacuum decay. And it's the idea that the laws of physics might not be the same everywhere. It's actually something that is normally invoked in this sort of multiverse picture where maybe you have one universe over here with laws like ours, but another universe somewhere else which has completely different physical laws. And if that's the case, if it's actually possible to have different laws of physics in one part of space from another, then unfortunately there's also a chance that the laws of physics in our universe will spontaneously change. And that's something called vacuum decay. And if that happens, it's absolutely catastrophic because obviously if the laws of physics change overnight, then uh, everything just sort of ceases to exist. There's no way that you can continue to operate. And you'd get no warning either. The way this would actually happen would be a sort of little bubble would form somewhere in our universe and it would expand out at the speed of light so you wouldn't be able to see it coming and everything within it would have different laws of physics. But uh, it's not likely to happen anytime soon. Stop. I have had enough of this. Bubble universes, the big freeze, you and that bunch of physicists, you really, I mean, this is making stuff up. I don't think this is science. Give me data or give me death. Universal heat death. You're just making stuff up. This is pub conversations, right? These are unanswerable questions that no one knows the answer to. Well, in which case, you're probably not going to like the next bit. Has it? <laughs> oh, no. Hey, did you ask Andrew about the Boltzmann brain paradox like I asked you to? Yes, I did. Ah, uh, yeah, trust Hannah to come up with it. That is the most philosophical point you could have asked about. And in fact, it's sort of Achilles' heel in cosmology right now. Because if you ask what seems like a fairly reasonable question, which is, 
where in space and time are typical conscious people located? So it's a sort of question about where does life arise? Where could consciousness arise? And you make a stab at answering, obviously it's a very difficult question to answer, but you make a stab at answering that you get completely nonsensical answers. And one of the nonsensical answers you get is actually in the far future of the universe, there's so much of it, there's so much space, there's so much time still to come, that there'll be plenty of time for just random events to take place, where randomly uh, a brain just appears out of nothing. Now this is due to something called quantum mechanics and the effect in quantum mechanics that anything can appear out of nothing and then disappear again. So obviously, it's incredibly rare for a brain to appear out of nothing and disappear. We'd notice if these things kept popping up around us. But there is so much time in the future that occasionally one of these things will pop into existence and then disappear. And because there is so much of that time available, it's possible that the Boltzmann brains, that's what they're called, outnumber the real biological brains. <laughs> And it gets, it gets worse, it gets worse, because then you say, well, I'm probably typical. I mean, I should probably be a sort of typical person in the history of the whole cosmos. Therefore, I should expect myself to be one of those brains. And the fact that I think I'm talking to you about cosmology now, I think I have a day-to-day -day life, it's probably just the result of random fluctuations that led to the neurons firing in a particular way to give me the illusion of a normal life. You can see why nobody takes this terribly seriously, but it's kind of worrying for cosmology because we don't really know what the way out of that is. We can see it's nonsensical, but we don't really know exactly what is wrong with the arguments that lead to that conclusion. I get that not everyone is taking this seriously and it's more like a pub conversation. Parking mode off. I wrote about this in the glass, uh, Alex. The day before uh, the funeral, um, Patrick Inanna was lying in state in the cathedral and people work in the glass of this coffin and an epidemiologist has pointed out well that's a great way of spreading germs and um, in terms of restrictions new restrictions are coming into place today in serbia and um, all shops and other facilities well, all businesses will have to close from six o'clock in the evening and um, gatherings are limited but we're not sure yet whether that applies to church services as well guy thank you guy delaunay in belgrade you're listening to the bbc world service justine has the headlines three weeks after the u.s election the formal handover of power from donald trump to president-elect joe biden has begun russian scientists have announced further positive data from trials of their coronavirus vaccine and as you've been hearing the bishop who led the funeral service of the head of the serbian orthodox church who died with coronavirus is now in hospital with the disease after nearly three weeks of fighting, the UN Security Council is due to hold its first meeting on the conflict in northern Ethiopia later. Talks come amid conflicting claims and counterclaims from the central government in Addis Ababa and forces of the TPLF in the northern region of Tigray. Saviano Abre of the United Nations office in Nairobi says as the fighting continues, the humanitarian crisis is getting worse. We are calling on all parts of the conflict to show a low, safe and free movement of people. So people that are seeking safety can leave and also it's urgent to allow free passage for humanitarians to reach the area and to access the situation and to support people who need assistance there. Earlier I spoke to our Africa correspondent Catherine Yaruhanga. The focus now, Alex, is on the city of Mekele in Tigray. This is the regional capital. It's home to nearly half a million people. And what the government is saying is that they've surrounded the city. They're asking, they're asking those who can leave to leave. And they say that because they've given this 72-hour ultimatum for Tigrayan forces to surrender, that hundreds of people have surrendered. But obviously the Tigrayan authorities see this very different. They say this is propaganda from the government. And in fact, they say they've destroyed a mechanized division and shot down a helicopter. But it's really hard to get any verifiable information from Tigray. There's a communications blackout and journalists are not allowed in the area. We heard from the UN just before we came to you about the worsening humanitarian situation. How many people are on the move? And one of the most pressing needs. Well, it's really hard for us to paint a picture of what's happening in Tigray itself. 
but we've seen 40,000 people flood into neighboring Sudan. This is a country that's already stretched. Aid agencies and authorities there are busy trying to set up camps and to provide food for those who fled. UN agencies are asking for $50 million in order to be able to help people there. But the UN, as you heard there, are asking for humanitarian corridors within Tigray itself where they could reach people who are stranded and for those who can leave to be able to get out. But how concerned is the international community about the conflict, and I'm thinking particularly Ethiopia's neighbours? Well, just think about Sudan itself that's now taking in ten, tens of thousands of refugees from Ethiopia. This is a country that already hosts a million refugees. For a country like that, it's very important that the situation in Ethiopia is resolved. We've also heard from the African Union, which has appointed peace envoys to be able to go to Addis Ababa to mediate in a conflict, but we're still waiting for those envoys to get there. Catherine Yaruhanga. Sweden has been one of only a few Western nations to avoid an official lockdown during the coronavirus pandemic, but stricter measures have come into force there too. This comes amid a sharp rise in cases and deaths in Sweden in recent weeks. A reporter in Stockholm, Maddie Savage, told us more. The new ban is all about drastically reducing the size of public events to try and slow the spread of the virus. So things like concerts, sports competitions, demonstrations. These events have mostly been kept to a 50-person maximum throughout the pandemic. Well, the government actually gave the go-ahead for socially distanced events of up to 300 people at the start of the month. So this is a big turnaround on that policy. And ministers say anyone who breaches the law and tries to put on one of these events could be fined or face a prison sentence of up to six months. And the move follows a couple of other important stricter measures in recent days. A separate rule of eight was introduced in pubs and restaurants, so a maximum of eight people per table, and a ban on serving alcohol after 10 o'clock that came in on Friday. And this really is a big change of tack for Sweden. I think in terms of how much this impacts on Swedes' everyday lives, we've got to be cautious about overstating that. This eight-person limit doesn't include private parties or, or events at home. Uh, and you can even still book gym classes for up to 28 people at my local gym. Uh, pubs and restaurants and shops are still open. This isn't the lockdown we've seen in other countries, but it is part of a, a bigger shift in tone in Sweden. The government is appears to be really trying to crack down on how much social contact people are having and the Prime Minister has said that even though it's not the law to stop socialising in bigger groups, he wants people to avoid spending time with anyone they don't live with. How are Swedes taking it? A mixed response. I think Swedes have got used to their relative freedom during the pandemic compared to other countries, so some are disappointed. But then Swedes are also prone to following rules and guidelines. They have trust and faith in, in authorities. That's historic and has continued uh, largely during the pandemic. Uh, in April, May, June, studies suggested Swedes were quite compliant to the guidelines they have, things like working from home, using public transport, less. That did bring cases down, but the Prime Minister has said people got too relaxed by September. They started socialising more, going back to the office. Students were allowed back to university. Now he wants people to be more mindful of their behaviour. The new rules are part of that, but voluntary responsibility is still very much part of the strategy. We'll have to wait and see whether it works. Maddie Savage in Stockholm. Afghanistan has traditionally produced the bulk of the world's heroin, but now it's also becoming a major international supplier of the dangerously addictive and illegal drug methamphetamine, or crystal meth. Now, a report by the European Union's drug monitoring body warns of meth production with street values of tens of millions of dollars could soon not strip that of heroin. There have been multiple international seizures of vast quantities of the drug in recent months, which was suspected of originating in Afghanistan.